It is right now, um, 2 p.m. Kuwait time, um, sharp time, wherever you are. Um, and I think this is the start of session B5, Vernaculars, New and Old Transforming Typologies. Um, I'd like to remind everyone about the rules and the regulations of uh, these sessions. Please do not um, uh, videotape these sessions as there are copyrights with the authors. Um, and um, please, we will give, we will give uh, 20 minutes for each presenter. Um, at the 17th minute, three minutes before the end, I will change my screen to yellow, and then I will change it to red when it's one minute left. And um, we will keep all the questions until the end of the presentations. I, I believe we have three, um, unless the fourth presenter join us soon. So with that, I'm going to introduce the first presenter. We have uh, Debbie Willen. Willen, sorry if I pronounce the name incorrectly, I apologize in advance. Holds a PhD in anthropology, as well as undergraduate and postgraduate degrees in architecture. She, is currently, wor she currently works at the University of Lincoln, um, although all of her research work uh, continues to be carried out in South Africa. Her interest involves changing society, social and physical infrastructure, the unseen elements of the built environment. She is an expert in vernacular architecture of the KwaZulu Natal region of South Africa, has an interest in understanding intangible heritage, in addition to being significantly involved in the current land and restitution of land process in the country. The paper title, The Show and the Show House, Lifestyle traditions in the digital age. Please share your screen, Sebi. Okay. Are we shared? Hang Not on. yet. Are we shared? Yes. There we go. Now, now you are. Yes. Fantastic. So, thank you everybody for being here and listening to me. Um, and I think, as um, Mohammed has said, I'm really, really sort of think quite deeply about cultural change. And my exploration of cultural change is usually through an architectural lens, um, or strictly speaking, through a built environment lens. And this particular paper is, to some degree, consolidates a lot of ideas I've had about, um, about emerging hybrid architectures in South Africa pretty much in the last 10 years. And um, it's something which I'm currently working with some of my old students at the Durban University of Technology in developing this into a sort of um, a sort of holistic understanding of decolonized architecture on 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 the southern tip of of, of Africa. So um, the first thing that's important. Hang on, I've got to. Um, so in terms of looking at at the abstract. Um, there are a number of, of sort of um, standards that we look at in terms of being able to look at architecture in both um, developed and developing environments. And we specifically, with the thread of this particular conference, look at the ideas of traditions, but then also indigenous vernaculars. And these are vernaculars which are constantly evolving. Um, and I suppose it's the remaking of tradition. Whereas when I'm talking about vernacular here, um, in terms of the South African context, it really is starting to look at the sort of influences of many of the settler groups um, which moved into South Africa from about the 16th century onwards. Um, so for me, this is really important because what the, the, sort of, the sort of series of work that I've been doing is starting to do is um, being able to start positioning societies at the interface of change, and it's societies at the interface of change of modernity, societies at the interface of change of um, diametrically opposite um, cultures with which they interact, and also with multiple ways of seeing. So my general exploration of the built environment for the last 20 years certainly has been centered on the Zulu. Um, when I studied architecture, our university was, or our school of architecture was considered almost as an armed wing of transformation, pretty much in the province. And so my work on the Zulu came out of many of my architectural studies and my understanding of Zulu culture and um, Zulu, Zulu society 
is founded quite strongly on a tradition which has been reinforced and developed certainly since the mid 18th century. And you will find that authors like Cooper, for example, um, really start looking at the, the sort of concretization to use a word of um, what is called the central cattle pattern. And on the right hand side of my screen, you can see an image of the um, homestead of Bingang Kasenza Kakona, who was one of the major tribal chiefs in the, in, the, um, in the 19th century, you can see there that it follows what's called a central cattle pattern, where the, where the homestead is not only centrally placed around a central cattle buyer, and in the homesteads of the, of the elite, this was also a political space, but cattle are also central to Zulu society. And this particular thread is something that I'm pulling through my understanding of moving from rural areas through to, <coughs> through to urban areas and the tradition which may have breaks or mutations or iterations in those spaces. Um, I've also worked quite extensively with indigenous vernaculars. My master's degree, which was carried out in the early, late 1990s, early 2000s, <coughs> was on indigenous vernacular buildings in an area um, called Msinga, which is central to KwaZulu-Natal province. And this was really looking at the development of homesteads which had paintings on them. Um, and you can see on the left hand side, there is a very old painting dating back to probably the mid 70s on the, on the edges of doorways into a particular building in one of the homesteads. And on the right hand side, you can see an image taken by Wyndham Hartley in the 1970s, which is showing you those particular buildings in the central cattle pattern, which is compromised a bit by the landscape, which has forced the homesteads into terraces. But you can see there that the development of tradition, the mutation of tradition into indigenous vernaculars um, presupposes a very willing to take on different ideas, um, but also to develop those ideas very strongly Within, um, within quite bounded cultural traditions. And one of the things in this particular area was very specific approaches to beadwork and the way in be which beadwork was able to signify status, hierarchy and, and um, positions in society. So also, and this you can see is also an image from 1997 um, this is also demonstrating the ability to start moving between rural and urban spaces, but to be able to take some of the, the um, really critical dwellings which form part of um, rural homesteads with people to the townships or to urban areas. So this particular photograph was taken into Gela Ferry, which is an urbanized part of Msinga, taken in 1997. And one of the things which is important here is firstly the use of, of thatch. Thatch for many of the Zulu people um, indicates it's, it's, a, it's a material which has been traditionally used for centuries, but in terms of thatch, there's a very strong connotation with the ancestors. And so, for example, one of the most important threads which has been carrying through my work is trying to figure out where the ancestors are throughout these whole processes. Earlier on, I spoke about um, sort of societal and cultural change being at an interface of um, not only moving into modernity, but also sitting between um, very deeply entrenched ancestral religions and connections with a, an ever imbued relationship with the ancestors in your everyday life. And then the more detached way in which Christianity is embedded in both the built environment and also social environments. And so the ancestors are, are attracted by the thatch, being able to have thatched roofs invites the an ancestors into the building, but also buildings become spaces which are there specifically for the ancestors. And so it's looking at the cultural change and being able to mitigate that. So this is what I'm really, really interested in. And I think Gerald's probably having a bit of a laugh about this because these are new traditions. They are new vernaculars and they're poised right on the edge of cultural change. And what for me is so incredibly interesting is that for the architectural academia, um, for the architectural elite as it were, 
these are not only almost invisible, but they are also considered as being probably irrelevant and actually something to be mimicked. At the same time, these are fundamentally um, decolonized buildings which are produced through a negotiated, a culturally and socially negotiated series of, um, of ideas of prosperity and change. So to be able to say that these Italianate villas, these are now the buildings which dominate the rural environments, they dominate the urban environments, they dominate the peri-urban environments, and what they do is they also unseat all of the tropes that people in the, in, in the built environment or people in the property sector, for example, will actually consider as givens, and that's within a very strong Western framework. So I'm looking at a lot of this um, sort of through the lens of, of misbehavior, looking at misbehavior with Fromm's work in the 1960s, because a lot of this is misbehavior against, as I said, the sort of general understandings of how economy and society work. So the first thing is overcapitalization. Many of these buildings, many of these homesteads, which are Italianate, they're hybrid, they're characterized by gables, they're characterized by columns, particularly, particularly very fancy columns. They're characterized by some very daring structural um, decisions, which I can only like to a colleague of mine who teaches in heritage to possibly some of the experimentation that was happening in the UK, probably in about the 10th or 11th centuries. Um, but what they do do is they really display an excessive investment into property and site and building, which in a general property market would not be considered appropriate. Um, so a lot of money is spent on these buildings. And these buildings really are there to be able to demonstrate a rapidly risen black middle class. They're there to demonstrate um, significant lifestyle choices. And this conversation fits in with a few of the papers that have been presented in the last couple of days, but it really subverts many of the Western imported ideas of society and economy. At the same time, what for me is absolutely fundamentally interesting is that they subvert the development agenda. And as a, an intentionally socialist stroke neoliberal government, which came in in 1994, the African National Congress has spent a significant amount of time being able to demonstrate the provision of housing, the upliftment of people through education, and through access to jobs, but also to be able to narrow the poverty gap. Um, and I mean, I think it was last week, I think South Africa came out as one of the poorest gaps in the world with something like 34% of people being unemployed. At the same time, there hasn't been a formal census undertaken in South Africa since 2011. And so the government doesn't actually know where people are in terms of what they have in regards to homesteads and facilities. And these are all developments which have literally happened in the last 10 years. One of the things which has triggered this for me extensively is on a trip to the Eastern Cape, which is pretty much a very hidden province from the rest of the country, about three years ago, it was glaringly obvious that villages which previously had been little more than wattle and daub were now entire villages of um, these types of Italianate villas, four, four garage homes, four bedroomed homes in the middle of nowhere, built through remittance money through migrant labor. And these would still be in the development agenda be considered as being people who were poor living in substandard housing, but because there hasn't been a proper assessment of anything through census in the last 10 years, it means that these are all actually subverting the development agenda. And the development is happening in South Africa very rapidly. 
but it's at grassroots level. It's done largely through cash income, um, often laundered money, um, and it's a way of hiding laundered money, and it's done very incrementally. So there is very little record of many of these buildings being constructed. At the same time, um, there has been a significant movement in South Africa for the last 10 years, and this is spurred on by the fees must fall and the roads must fall events of 2015. Um, there's been a significant move to prioritize indigenization and decolonization as sort of mutual stepping stones of creating a Southern African identity and one which is indigenous and one which comes from the country. And this is no new discussion. Um, architects from about 1910 were figuring out how to represent knitting together very different cultural and architectural resolutions of the Dutch and the British, for example. Um, from the 1930s onwards, uh, architectural magazines were running co um, competitions to try and understand what South African architecture was. My studies at the University of Natal in the 1980s were largely deep considerations about what architecture should be. And yet all of these academic decisions have been taken over by a populist decision, socially negotiate, negotiated as to what African architecture is. And I think this for me is absolutely fascinating because it doesn't speak to the academia, it doesn't speak to the activists, it speaks to what um, an articulate, largely articulate black middle class wants and what a, what a potentially inarticulate black working class asp aspires towards. And so this is the production of a socially negotiated vernacular. This is something which comes from within, it's something which reduces um, the, it, it sort of reduces the, the power of some of the architectures which are found in the previously white suburban areas and particularly sort of intensive developments in the conurbation of, um, of Gauteng. Um, but these are also really interestingly found across the whole country. This is not only something which is produced in KwaZulu-Natal. And so the products of these buildings is largely through contemporary lifestyle and importantly for this con conference, digitization. It also for me is fundamentally interesting because it's producing with many of the, um, many of the areas in KwaZulu-Natal a retribalization. Um, the reason for this is many people of the black middle class who have been living in suburbs have had access to suburban land for the last 20 years, are now making decisions to move back into tribal trust areas, strictly speaking, to be able to avoid rates and taxes, which are incurred on properties within formal cities. And um, also what is becoming really important is to be able to return to tribal trust land in order to be able to make new ancestors. And this is stuff which is coming out of the research that I've been doing with my students, which I think is really important in informing how we as a, as a very interesting contemporary country are dealing with, with, with the built environment. Retribalization in itself is quite an interesting process because <clears throat> what people tend to do <clears throat> is they go and find a traditional authority area they approach the chief and they create an entire construct of lineage in order to be able to justify their settlement. And together with this is usually conveyed, um, conveyed a crate of beers and a couple of bottles of vodka because they have to pay tribute towards the particular chief. And in return, they will get land um, on which to build the houses. So that it's re-energizing many of the, um, the social linkages between tribal chiefs and their adherents or creating new adherents. Three minutes. So the other thing which is really interesting out of this is the role of the architect architectural professional. And I've spoken at length earlier about the, um, about the engagement of academia in trying to figure out a new South African architecture. But when we look at 
the Facebook post, which came out of the Independent Thinkers of South Africa early 2020. This is in a traditional authority area. We can see that the underground spread of these buildings, which are incrementally built, many of them, is um, is 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 absolutely it's 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 not stopping but at the same time what is really interesting is that the role of the architectural professional is not necessarily one who designs buildings but it also has got a prestige component and if we look at this video promotion which one of my students in Kosingapile Zungu gave me permission to share you will see not only is this marketed through Facebook but also um, it has got the traditional um, dwelling of the ancestors behind. As well as the cattle. Shut it. So I think for me, where I'm going with this is understanding that in many ways in Southern Africa, um, students coming out of universities of technology, working at the coalface of their societies, marketing their work through digital media, incorporating the ancestors as you can see from the thatched building on the left these are all processes of understanding societies and dramatic tradition transition and the way i'm looking at these is being able to sort of understand the transfer between rural as as the space of the ancestors and urban as very much formal secular spaces I hope that has been reasonably coherent and thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, um, Debbie. That was actually right on target. So right, right at the 20 minutes. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, and uh, now we will go to our next presenter. Actually, I don't know if our next presenter is, is available right now. Um, Yang Ming Chen, I don't see him in the list. Um, I believe he probably is not here in the room, Yang Ming. Yang Ming Chen. So in this case, we will move to our third presenter. Um, our third presenter is um, Xiao Cheng. Xiao Cheng is currently a PhD student at the Department of Architecture and Built Environment, University of Nottingham, UK. Before coming to Nottingham, uh, Xiao Cheng um, has worked for five years from 2012 to 2017 as an architect in a reputable architectural design institute in Zhangjiang uh, University, and he has obtained <clears throat> the PRC class one registered architect qualification. The paper that uh, Xiao will be presenting is production of space in traditional towns and villages <clears throat> in a mode with uh, Chinese uh, characteristics, a study of urban form of um, um, which we true, if I pronounced it correctly, I don't know. We true from 1998 to nine to 2018. Please share your screen. Okay. Uh, is my screen has been shared to to all? Okay. Thank you for everyone being here and listening to my topic. And the title has been a little bit modified to the production of space in traditional towns and village against the backdrop of Chinese characteristics. And uh, I will use uh, a case study in Huizhou, uh, uh, actually a cultural area in Eastern China to demonstrate my arguments. The first two page you say is a compression of the, I would say, uh, the obvious form change between the times. The left one is 20 years ago and the right hand one is on 
probably three years ago from Google, of course. And you can see in the age of traditional towns, the expansion of the um, uh, residential districts and other uh, building areas. So as Professor Mohammed has introduced that I, before I was an architect and I mainly deal with all kinds of forms in a hectic uh, mode, just uh, very busy, a lot of projects. So when I got the opportunity to study in Nottingham, I came here without hesitation to think about what essentially happened between what I'm doing. So, so my topic come to um, focus on the forms, the issues behind the design and the issues behind all kinds of uh, forms or architecture forms, urban forms. And uh, specifically, my topic is focused on the areas outside cities, because enough or, or plenty of discussions have been focused on Chinese cities. And uh, so my topic will uh, change to or alter to, to the, the rural areas roughly. So in things, actually things the opening up or for the uh, past uh, 30 years, there has been profound formal transformation in areas outside Chinese cities in traditional towns and the village. And the background is that that has been a it is a result of national political policies, which is promoting the rural development and urban rural integration. And in my argument, I would say the essence is that a new kind of production space that reflects the efforts to achieve the socialism with Chinese characters in rural areas. And my research question is that for the problem, there have been great poor understanding of this form transformation and the related rituals of tradition in design disciplines, of course, uh, urban planning, architectural design, or uh, urban design. And the aim of this paper is that to see the issues of the changing rural form as a point of departure to build, try to build an analytic mode to understand this space production and also taking Huizhou region in Anhui province as a research field. If you can see, the big picture in this page, this is shrinking traditional settlements and the expanding modern residential districts of Huizhou town, or traditional town in Huizhou. First, I'm going to look at the rural form problem and what is Chinese characteristics in this paper. So the rural form problem come, mainly came from the rural policy since 1998. That is a, I mean, consecutive series of uh, strong rural policies from top down, such as building a new socialist countryside and the construction of a beautiful village, new type of urbanization, rural revitalization for the latest one. And uh, I think all of them are aimed to breaking a dual, dualistic structure in rural and urban development. And if you can see, there's a, there's a call for cities paying back rural areas where previously has been exploited by industrialization since uh, the building of, of, of PRC in 1949. And uh, it can be seen as uh, elevating the global and domestic economic crisis by using the huge area or using the resiliency of rural areas as a reservoir to absorb uh, over accumulation of capital for example, the new physical properties for rural tourism in this area, as example, to, to, to introduce the, the, mean the investments to, to be fixed in the properties. It also can be seen as a stabilization strategy intended to create opportunities and incentives for rural people to remain in towns and villages, not too much people going to the cities for, for the migrant workers, as, as an example. All of this has caused a huge increase in the construction of fixed capital assets. For this background, there's a, a fundamental great response from designers. They saw there's a great opportunity to support rural areas through design. And there's also a great wave of design going to a countryside with theoretical knowledge, often in conflict with local realities. There's a, 
a traditional Chinese saying that they are compose a song by pretending sadness first. They often construct problems, not solve problems yet. So what do they bring to the rural areas? Is in building configuration or settlements layout and the urban form. This is what they uh, engage with the form there. For example, urban planning also holds a Marco political view and uh, architectural design, which has been overly individualized and there's a sort of formal anarchy there. And urban design, interestingly, there's no urban design in rural area of China for, for many years. Urban design has been only contested in the city areas. It's yet to be, uh, I mean, uh, implanted in the rural areas. So when design facing rural areas, there's also deep contradictions and wider divides between various stakeholders, if we, if we say beyond the issues in design. And for the Chinese characters, uh, it is an inclusive and evolving concept actually distinguish Chinese special mode of development from which dis 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 distinguish it from capitalism from the West and uh, socialism from the Soviet Union, I would say. And also it could be a theoretical innovation, a practical innovation of maximalism and the scientific socialism in response to, to the evolving Chinese realities. It, also, it has also been applicable for, for, for the contemporary times and the realities in China now. So if we say specifically in rural areas, the institution of a socialist market economy and some new policies for the revitalization and the governance. This is uh, what we call, what I call the Chinese characters in rural areas. So I need to say uh, also the new principal contradiction facing Chinese sociality, which has been defined by the national discourse, that the principal contradiction has been between unbalanced and inadequate development and the people's ever-growing desire for a better life. So this is all the background. And if you can see the two pictures in the left-hand side, it's a traditional strike in the Huizhou area. Uh, for example, the, the upper one is a Li, is a straight in 2005, and the, the down, the, uh, the, uh, the below one, it's 15 years later. The right one is the old heritages, which has been left, and all of that has been gone and been replaced by a commercial development. The involvement of design disciplines in proper or in, in problems of rural form. Let's say specifically what's happening in design is discipline. For architectural practice, the approach to the rural form of Huizhou or other parts of China has been roughly descriptive. For example, surveys, mappings, and uh, analysis of tectonics. Some new technologies, for example, the digital construction, which has been a fashionable expression has also shown in the rural, rural areas of China. And so of course, some, some astrological approaches, which could be seen as a, only a historical account, which is not compatible to the modern time. And some has been already explored contemporary conditions in the rural form transformation in, in, in the Chinese context. And for saying the planning, rural planning has a, actually been identified in 2007, the, 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 the national law, with, but with the, the, the whole rural planning system far less clear than that of cities. So for the planners, they roughly just transporting the urban planning methods and ideas to rural areas from a top-down perspective. And for the recent two years, I think start from the 2019, there's a new emerging national territorial spatial planning system came out, which aims to incorporate all kinds of resources or spatial resources in the whole national territory. That's a very ambitious planning system. However, there are still little detailed grounded formal design in the planning and the government regulatory side. For urban design, the gap in between uh, I mean, in between in rural areas, between architecture and uh, planning in rural areas is similar to that as urban design would bridge in cities. But however, however, since urban design has been highly contested in Chinese cities, it's 
its apl application to the more complex rural areas has been yet to see. So it is still more pro problematic of the application of urban design to rural areas. So that's a, going to be a question. Is that going to be a conceptual counterpart of urban design that can be applied to the issue of rural form transformation, for transformations? It's interesting to see if there is a counterpart of urban design or, or would we call it a rural design? For typology or urban morphology, it seems they are useful. And a lot of scholars has applied this, this kind of method to, 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 to the rural areas. However, they are limited largely to, I think, to, to urban districts with relatively stable histories, like a town in Europe or town in you know, very traditional uh, Europe's, Europe, Europe uh, village or traditional Europe city, but often random external and deterministic influence upon Chinese areas limit the usefulness of these methods. And a group of scholars has connected the problem of changing form to the paradigm of Chinese political economy. They follow the, sorry, the works of Marx, Lefebvre, and Harvey. They saw, they saw the form is a social production space within a particular Chinese context. However, they solo focus on cities, and none of them has yet to, to develop a way to explain, to explain the real mechanism of space production. Uh, for the picture, that a typological mapping of Asian Huizhou is a conventional way of, of you know, this, this corruptive approach to the, to the Huizhou developments, uh, which has been done by the Southeast University of Nanjing. So my argument is to throw out a customized analytical approach to the production of space. Uh, I say this problem politically. It is uh, in line with Henry Lefebvre's critic, uh, social production of space, as he has said, the production of space can be linked to a production of any particular type of merchandise. I try to link this to the Chinese, I mean, backgrounds, the Chinese realities. So from the case study and also the, the field research, I, I found that the form has been operated mainly in one direction. It has been directed by local government from top down with public funds or private capital and production and a supply of physics space through the policy roughly called land finance or, or through political responsibilities. And the local people from bottom up is a space receiver. If you can see the, the picture the background in, in the left hand side. And the designer has been situated in the middle. It's being employed or self-employed, limited or liberated. It is a very simple and uh, direct uh, three level diagram. But interestingly, it has been in line with the dialectic relationship of social space, which articulated by Lefkin. So the top logic from the local government and from the capital really speaks of the representation of space, which could be called conceived space. And the bottom, in, I mean, the people inhabit representational, sorry for that pronunciation, which can be said the lived space. And the middle with designers, I see the designers try to connect or should connect the conceived and lived space through space practice, through perceived space, which is real space. So the top down driving force is as a supply of space that is conceived and the bottom up local community as a receiver and occupier of the conceived space. They leave the conceived space to the lived space. The middle level as a designer is, that is, that is the designer of space, which is first perceived and also <laughs> conceived and lived in. So if you see the situation in Huizhou, I will give a brief introduction of Huizhou. It, it is in the eastern part of China. Located in the southern Anhui province, it, it was once a united administrative region with six traditional counties from the single state, I mean, anciently. But the administration has been broken apart in modern areas. And uh, in 1987, 
a new city called Hongshan City has been established. It is famous for tourism. And uh, uh, UNESCO has been uh, nominated as UNESCO World Heritage Site. And uh, the leader, former leader Deng Xiaoping, ever visit there uh, to encourage low governments to better play Huangshan card, to better compose Huizhou literature, which has been a strong local mentality to celebrate the role of Huangshan Mountain and compose a strong uh, emotion or mentality of Huizhou culture. So in local context, that grows a strong sense of identity of tradition. And uh, I mean, together with the uh, EU conceived development projects, it has been limited by conditions of history and geography. For example, it is a mountainous area with limited development land and weak rural industries. And also it is close to the developed cities of the Yangtze River Delta. So it become a prime target for the new capital flows from these developed areas. So the case study to focus on two aspects of the local production space, all relating to housing problem, because this is the most close one to the people. The, incre mm -hmm. sorry, the incremental development of new residential districts as the age of Huizhou larger towns and the relocation and renovation that have altered the character of ex existing inventory of residential structure across all levels of settlements. So if you can see the new residential districts, which is, uh, we call it building change by increments, uh, the local governments, mainly focus on land finance, which is land leasing income to support interest industries. And uh, for the investors, probably most of them are non-professional because it is traditional towns, it's not cities, and they are in, in, in experience. They are re reluctant investors so to, to, to also some non-gated communities. For the local people, they are accepting their they saw this moving to the new residential districts as self-actualization. They accept this place and modify you know, the space and form while bringing uh, and reviving the tradition. For the designers, they are largely indif indifferent, detached, they fulfilling the design tasks and they have less design income and confined by lots of regulations. For second case, the things condition has been changed. Local government take a back seat. There's no director or like land finance. So, uh, so they try to generate tax revenue and uh, for, 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 uh, for encourage other ways of raising funds. For the investors, they, they are lower threshold and they are diversified. So anyone is possible to become an investor to, to join these form games. The local people, they are more positive. And they, you know, they, they, the meaning, the, the life of, 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 of tradition has not been changed compared to the first case, but the meaning has been changed. The form has not been changed. The meaning has been changed. So barely locals also, okay. So for the designers, they are liberated and sometimes indulged. They're free of effective restrictions. They can be client, investor and designer at all once. So for the conclusion, I would argue a more active role of designer. They should play a stronger role to less superficial and self-referential. There should be actually a negotiator to connect three kinds of space, the creating high quality place to fix the capital and to promoting sustainable contextual design values, filling the void. Uh, sorry for not controlling time. That's pretty much everything. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zhao. Um, uh, very actually interesting and fascinating presentation. Um, we move Sorry, to the, the time is quick too fast. I, I, I haven't mm -hmm. seen any the time. Yes. Before. Yeah. No, that, that happens a lot in, in conferences. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, but we have to abide by, by the regulations. Okay. The... So I'm, not, I'm going to end sharing of my screen and let the, the, the third presenter to come. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, and we will have we will have plenty of time for discussion afterwards because we do have only three presentations today. Um, the fourth presenter I don't see in the list. I don't see him um, showing up yet. So I'm assuming it's just the three presenters for today. So with that, we come to the third presentation by uh, Professor Ali uh, Raouf. 
Ali Raouf is, um, is an architect, urban designer, and planner interested in research and practice related to architecture and comprehensive sustainable design and urban planning. Um, his work focuses on research within the domain of theory, criticism, creativity in architecture and urbanism. He has published um, 105 journal refereed papers, critical reviews, essays, in addition to books and book chapters. And he um, has delivered uh, lectures and presentations in over 25 countries. Raouf is a visiting professor at HBK University and acts as a head of the, the research and development <clears throat> unit at the urban planning section in Qatar. Uh, the title of his presentation, The Virtue and the Virtual in the Age of Vanishing Reality, Gulf Architectural and Urban Heritage. Please, Professor. Thank you, ahead. Professor Mohammed. For the sake of time, I want to go directly to uh, the presentation. And uh, I think we're lucky that we'll have more time for questions and answer later. So the, uh, as you see, the, the clear title of my presentation is The Virtue of the Virtual in the Age of Vanishing Reality. But you will see that I also added a couple of words in a shy format, contesting and interrogating. And I think this is the beauty of IASTE that uh, it would give us a platform to examine everything, including the main theme of, of, of the Congress. And uh, the, way, the way I want to narrate my, my paper or my research is I want to pose the main question and then I will talk about what I called it the conceptual triology. I will also shed light on my understanding of authenticity versus fakeness. And then a bit of uh, talk about the evolution of Gulf heritage uh, appreciation and conservation, examining some regional case studies, and I end up with uh, some conclusions. Um, so my conceptual triology is based on three fundamental concepts, the notion of the authentic, the fake, and the authentic fake. And, and this is so much related to how I see a sort of a dilemma, a conflict, a confrontation between reality versus virtuality. And also the notion of that we started to approach a paradigm where heritage is not related to a place and therefore identity even is not, it doesn't need a roots in this sense. So when it comes to identity, in my paper, I was trying to shed light on the notion of people and the dynamism of people. And therefore, particularly when it comes to the to Gulf context, you'll see in a lot of situation that the presence of diverse people is creating a sense of, of, of uh, um, kind of red flag towards the local identity, towards who we are exactly. Are these our invaders to our context? Or we should look at them as part of the tapestry or the mosaic of people working and living in, this, in Gulf cities. And, and, and if we extend this to the notion of architecture, you would also see that in a country uh, like Qatar and in, in a city like Doha, the capital, in the last 10, 15 years, there were a lot of uh, amazing and in, in incredible pace of development in the way architecture was used to create a different sense of identity to the country, an identity that would suggest that the country is moving towards modernization and globalization. Top architects from all over the world were hired to contribute and leave their fingerprints. And hence, you would ask, are all of these, either in Qatar or in the rest of the, uh, of the Gulf, are really contributing to the dynamic interpretation of identity, dynamic interpretation of heritage, or identity and heritage are so much related to a specific time frame that is selected one way or another by the local people or by scholars or by historians. And what is interesting that even the way the country exhibited its identity through stamps, for instance, is in itself uh, witnessing an interesting change. So instead of all these stamps suggesting the old uh, heritage, the traditional settlements, the old mosques, 
Now the country is so pr pr proud of very, very ultra modern uh, contribution to its uh, urban fabric. Particularly, this is the case of uh, the new national library designed by UM Kulhas. And this would go all the way to how also there is a sense of a fallacy in terms of understanding national identity. So you talk about national identity, and at the same time, you talk about the Arabia Riviera, and you use the language from Italian cities, again, to, 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 to provide this uh, or to allow the city to have a spot on the global stage. But this would also raise a fundamental question regarding who exactly is taking decisions when it comes to what to keep and what to preserve and what to demolish and destroy. Because in a lot of cities, again, around the Gulf, Doha is not exception, a huge part of its uh, traditional heritage was demol demolished and was demolished in a very uh, uh, celebrated manner because this heritage was a representation of harsh days when all of these cities were basically very humble uh, fishermen and, and traditional settlements. And therefore, the, 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 the whole heritage is, is sort of subjected to deconstructed and then reconstructed process depends again on this dynamic understanding of the value of old heritage. So in some cases, we need to get rid of it. And in some other cases, we need to conserve it and preserve it. And with that, I would also stress, as I did in my paper, the notion of what I called it the multicultural ethics, boundaries, and choices. We are talking about cities where 80 to 90% of the population are expats. And I'm, I'm, I'm not exaggerating saying that where I work, for instance, Hamad bin Khalifa University, we have professors coming from 70 countries and students coming from more than 90 countries, and all of them are mingling in this, in this knowledge center. So I think we need also to look at this as a sort of uh, uh, an asset rather than a threat. And in this sense, when we talk about identity, I think we talk, the dynamism that I'm calling for in the paper is also related to listening to the voice of all these people. And the second interesting concept that I, I, I was investigating in the paper is related to this notion of the vanishing reality and the virtual. And uh, I want to touch here upon the notion of copy. And uh, uh, prof my dear friend uh, and Professor Nizari Sayyad used beautifully in the end of the first keynote speech the example of uh, the Statue of Liberty on the stamps. And here I would use also on the notion of the copy the pyramid and how the pyramid is also replicated in Las Vegas. But what is interesting is that group of architects and, and archaeologists in Egypt are doing now a sort of a campaign and a legal battle to sue Las Vegas Luxor Hotel for imitating the pyramid. And while doing that, they actually created a legitimacy for the copy and, and, and without understanding that the copy is gaining more legitimacy and more reality because of what they are doing and considering that the hotel is a threat to a 5,000 years uh, a, a pyramid. The same story goes with the, with the Eiffel Tower. And Nizar also talked about that the number of people visiting the tower, the, 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 the fake tower in Las Vegas, are by far more than the people visit the tower in Paris. But what is interesting also that, the, again, this fake tower is used in a, another context within, within the Gulf to be used as a catalyst for uh, urban development. This is a development called the Falcon, where you have all the wonders of the world articulated together with the real estate development to create, again, another sort of real estate fantasy. But Again, the notion of the authentic versus the fake is interesting in this example because this is an example where a very uh, humble person who used to be a postmaster and after his retirement, because of his unconditional love to his wife, he decided to build her a tomb so similar to Taj Mahal. And because of this human aspect, because of this authentic human story, suddenly his tomb is becoming 
more valuable even than the copy, the, the, the original that he copied from because of this, as I said, the, the, the human aspect. Uh, when it comes to the Gulf also, it's very important to understand that although all those Gulf cities are so close, they have family relationships, blood relationships, the same language, the same religion, and so on and so forth, but also they have peculiarities and they have distinctiveness that we need to understand and acknowledge. And therefore, one size fits all is not going to work when it comes to dealing with their heritage and traditions. And I would argue that Gulf heritage appreciation and conservation went into four main paradigms. The first paradigms, I would call it documentation and virtuality. And we fall into in love with this notion of documentation. So, so do we document with, the, with hand sketches and drawings, and then we document with cameras, and then we had the digital cameras, and then we had 3D scanners, and when, then we document again with laser scanners, and so on and so forth. And you keep on asking what's exactly the value of documenting what was documented and the endless chapter of documentation. This is a project that I was invited to, to, to advise it on. And then after two or three meetings, they told me, no, we don't need you anymore because of the very important fact that all the outputs of the project were there. But they are repeating what was there again because of the love of the of the virtuality and, and documentation. The second paradigm, I call it negative conservation, which leads to a, a inevitable deterioration. When you just conserve an isolated building, hoping, and you close it after that, hoping that this is would maintain it, but you end up with, as I said, inevitable deterioration. The third paradigm is kind of theatrical, where you create a space they called it the cultural village or the the heritage village. And, and this place is only used in occasions, one of which would be the national day of the, of the country. And people would come here to enjoy a 100% fakeness of their tradition and, and history. And the very end and the fourth paradigm is rehabilitation of buildings and maybe giving them also a new roads and new functions. But this would end up with isolated building, usually totally divorced from the context and totally divorced from the local community around it. And all of this was done very similar to what is done in, in the Gulf, particularly in Dubai, when it comes to real estate uh, development, build it and then they will come. So the assumption was conserve it and then they will come. But I would argue in the cases that I have anal uh, analyzed in, in my paper, that this is not the case. And I have particularly narratives from Dubai, Mana, Dubai in UAE, Manama in Bahrain, Doha in Qatar. And I have selected from the three cities, the same kind of urban setting, which is a souk, the market, the traditional market, because it's a catalyst for urban diversity and it has outstanding value when it comes to understanding the, the fabric and the, socia the sociality of uh, Middle Eastern cities and Gulf cities in general. My very first case called Medina, Medina Til Jumeirah in Dubai, and you see here the overall plan of the city. And it's, it's interesting when you compare the picture on the left, which is part of the real authentic heritage area in Dubai versus the picture on the, left, the right, which is part of a Jumeirah. Jumeirah was built 20 years ago, and the, the picture in the left is part of the city that was built 100, almost 100 uh, years ago. But you see that the authentic is vac vacant. It's lifeless, as opposed to the fake, which is packed of life. And then when you dig deep and you move into the different spaces or you ask people in the different interviews that I've conducted, I came up with the conclusion that people are happy about the vibrancy of the space. Not only that, a narrative has started to be constructed regarding that this part, this location is part of our heritage. And this kind of architecture should be seen as an answer to sort of fight the cultural invasion and uh, the, the threatened uh, local identity and so on. The case of Babel Bahrain in, in Manama, this is a very interesting souk 
and it's called Bab al Bahrain, the gate, which is, would be translated in English into the gate of Bahrain, which is actually the gate, and it has uh, uh, incredible, incredible historical significance for Bahrainis. Uh, it leads to uh, uh, the, the main traditional market and it connects the sea where the, 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 the old fishermen villages with their boats would come with fish and other goods from Iran, from India, and so on and so forth. And then they walk through the gate towards the souk. And this is part of the fabric. And you can see here the sort of the contradiction between the traditional fabric versus the new fabric now started to uh, occupy the waterfront. Here are some uh, uh, images suggesting this dialogue between the old and the new, the dialogue between the old, the, the old fabric and the new fabric. But what was more interesting to me that this heart of the city, this market, during some specific religious festivities, very important to the Shia groups who are the, who are the majority in, in, in Manama, they, they occupy the place in a very dramatic manner and they enjoy and reinvent the relation between people and places in a way that would create an unforgettable experience. But yet, when they started to do a renovation for the project, the whole idea was related to how to get rid of the old parts of the zoo and replace it with some buildings that only uh, imitate the superficiality of some uh, 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 architectural uh, elements from the past. And therefore you end up some spaces that purely fake and has nothing to do with the past. And at the same time, and more importantly, not related to the event, not related to the essence of the place in terms of how people claim it and how people deal with it. And as I, as I heard from a lot of people in, in my interviews, we, we, we used to have a souk and we used to have a place for our celebrations and we ended up with a mall. So here it's very interesting in the Bahrain, in the Bahrain example that you see a very authentic place with a very authentic human narrative that would end up with a fake place with limited, uh, unlimited number of, of Starbucks. The, 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 the third and the final example is Souq Waqif in, in Doha. And uh, this is again, a very, very interesting example. And as you can see, a lot of evidences suggesting the, um, the use of traditional architecture. And uh, interestingly, uh, a professor of, a Middle Eastern professor of quote unquote Islamic architecture uh, nominated the project for the Aga Khan Award for Islamic Architecture. And when I met him, I told him that the whole souk was built in the last 10 years. There's no relation whatsoever with all what you see here with the originality of the souk. The souk called souk waqif, and waqif in English means standing. It was a very temporary souk. It was a, a number of very, very simple structures and maybe some textile that would cover people during the trade. And then after that, it's done. And, and what was more ironic that Aga Khan Award for Islamic Architecture in the category of historic preservation and conservation, they also suggested to move the project to the short list. But what I am I'm excited about in this project is that although it started mm -hmm. with Sure, those started with a very uh, fake approach, but the notion of the importance of people, the notion of giving people a different kind of experience when it comes to walkability, when it comes to uh, buying things, when it comes to stopping and having a good time in a very social spaces, ended up with transforming this place into one of the top destinations in, in the city and the country. Not only that, it is perceived now as our, the local identity of Qatar. And even a lot of scholars are writing about the project as an example of how we should preserve our heritage and maintain it. So I wanna end up with suggesting an alternative paradigm. I wanna ask, do we conserve for people or only for the materialistic, the materialistic as aspect and how we should integrate heritage with the contemporary condition? Therefore, I would call for 
post-conservation paradigm and, 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 and the features of this paradigm is to go beyond authenticity and fakeness and go beyond heritage for tourists and moving more towards integrated rather than isolated heritage areas and buildings and using heritage area as catalyst for holistic uh, urban development and the positive heritage of conservation by moving away from monumentality to museum-like museum environments. And, and therefore, I would go for conserve it, integrate it, and people are already there. But the, the condition here is to provide vibrant and livable and, and entertaining connections with the past, new spatial experience, a positive dialogue between the old and the new, cross-generational approach and to encourage the, the youth to enjoy the cultural continuity and the behavioral and cognitive values, which would help in constructing a, a, a more mm -hmm. dynamic notion of, of authenticity. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ali. And um, these were three very fascinating, very interesting topics. And the thread that connects them is, is you know, with the concept of transformation with the title of the, of the session, you know, uh, vernacular old new transforming typologies is very fitting. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna start with questions from my side. I'll see if the audience would like to have questions or any comments from, um, we have, we have plenty of time for now since our third, fourth presenter is not with us. Um, so um, any questions? And let me see the participants. If you have any question, you can raise your hand or, or um, open your mic. I do have questions that I can start with if, uh, if, uh, if still no one wants to start. Oh, um, Mohammed, this is Mark Gillum. Oh, Mark, go ahead. So, yes, those were great presentations. Uh, I really appreciate it. And the question is for Ali. Ali, you know, I don't even need to watch yours because I know yours is always going to be fantastic, uh, both your presentation and your paper, and really the, the organization of the theory and your willingness to just make broad conclusions and recommendations. Uh, you know, I certainly appreciate that. The question has to do with authenticity and fakeness. Uh, so you use these terms, and if, in fact, people are using these modern environments that would potentially be considered fake, uh, but if they're using them, how would that be different than authentic? Do you understand what I'm saying? Thank so you, I'm Mark. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much, and... Uh, it means a lot to me that you do appreciate what I'm doing research-wise and presentation-wise. You, you are a true friend and a scholar, and I'm so proud of you. Uh, when it comes to your, your uh, very crucial question, I would argue that it is not the problem of people. I would argue that it's the problem of decision makers, architects, urban designers, and also the, the, how the media construct uh, the, the perception of uh, authentic places versus fake or authentic fake places. In, in a way that I was trying to present this in my paper, that once you preserve one of the real authentic places, authorities, and, and I noticed that in a lot of cities around the Gulf, and maybe Professor Muhammad would, uh, would support me from cases from Kuwait, Authorities are not excited about questioning how those places would be a people's destination. What kind of activities would be generated there? Why not going beyond taking people in a bus, looking at it and leave, instead of putting it in a sort of uh, a catalyst, uh, 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 a sort of uh, center of development that would create life, literally. What is amazing and ironic here, Professor uh, uh, Mark, is that when you move to uh, the, the examples that I used, which I called it fake or authentic fake, from the early beginnings, they have a program, they have diverse activities, they have a way by which we need to attract people, and we need to attract people from different generations and different cultural uh, backgrounds and even ethnic backgrounds and so on and so forth. So 
to be honest with you, I wouldn't put the blame on, on people and community members, and I would put it more on authorities, planners, urban designers, program uh, uh, preparations, and so on and so forth. Thank you, sir. Yes, uh, well, I appreciate that. Uh, and I think, you know, the professions have a large amount of responsibility. But if one looks at, you know, your cases, and by the way, the photos were great. Uh, so, you know, Bahrain and Dubai, where patterns of traditional development are appropriated for modern use, so shopping areas, etc., within the context where they potentially emerged. That, that's one thing that could be considered authentic, although it's more modern interpretation, versus, you know, something that's completely lifted. So Las Vegas would be completely lifted, for example. Uh, or, for example, uh, suburban uh, low-density automobile-oriented developments outside of Cairo that are borrowing patterns from Bavaria or from the Pacific West Coast, those are completely lifted. So do you see, how do you see differences? You know, think about the gradation of authenticity. Is there something like that in your mind where something could be more authentic if it's from the local area in the local area, or does that really matter in your mind? No, I think, I think you're absolutely right, Professor Mark, that we have to look at it from a sort of a, a, a gradual kind of uh, levels of understanding. And I would, I would subscribe to the notion of cultural continuity in the sense that you look at traditional architecture and urbanism, but you don't only copy the, the visual vocabulary from those projects. Because, for instance, when it comes to Gulf architecture and urbanism, and giving the fact also the important point that I talked about in terms of diversity, the way they used to build in Kuwait is radically different than in Bahrain. You will have different treatments in Qatar, different kind of doors in Jeddah, and so on and so forth. But I would, I would argue that what is needed is to look also at the, the, the beyond the skin deep kind of approach to understanding and be inspired by Gulf architecture and urbanism. And in this sense, if we started to go into understanding more spatial relationships, more uh, people place kind of uh, relationships, more kind of event places, how people in the past used to use spaces to celebrate or to get together, or to exhibit, and so on and so forth. I think by doing that, you can end up with new buildings that are connected, but they are not copied. Mm. Thank you, sir. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Thanks. And then I have we one have more one. Yeah. This is for Debbie. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, and Debbie, I really appreciated you know, the, the imagery. Really, it connected to the theme of the conference, especially the last few slides where you were showing you know, the, the digital fly-through of suburban development compared to the reality. So I'm wondering, Debbie, that the issue of ethics in renderings, you know, how do you see architects, landscape architects, planners dealing with ethical renderings that actually show context and show the reality? Is there such a thing in your mind and how could that be addressed? I suppose right from the very outset when when this conference was was advertised in Coimbra, um, I had started to think about these buildings which my students were um, designing and advertising on Facebook. And I mean, I've got sort of, I suppose, 20 years of students that I'm friends with on Facebook. So, you know, this has been something which they've sort of shown off, but until recently, I hadn't realized that it was actually a platform for marketing. So right from the very beginning, my paper was going to be about digital, about digital sort of um, um, understand. It was, it was basically going to be a methodology of digital, digital mining, really, and it was using Facebook. And so my approach was always from a very ethical point of view. It was about looking at only at... Um, at Facebook sites, which like the independent thinkers of South Africa is an open public site. Um, so the ethics were quite seriously there right at the very beginning. Um, as far as I was concerned, and also at the same time, um, being able to do a lot of this work with five or six of my old students and 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 attributing them as, as 
part authors in papers that I write on this for me is, is ethical. However, when it comes to digital, the digital um, marketing that many of these architectural technologists, which many of them are some, sometimes they're senior architectural technologists, the digital marketing and the framework of, um, of ethics, as far as that's concerned, is very, very muddy water. And um, I, I think that whilst, again, ethics is something which sits within the realms of academia, and I can deal with the ethical approaches myself in terms of what I mine and what data I present, it's really, really difficult at the interface of social media to be able to to really control any ethical spread of information. Um, and I mean, fundamentally, I think what's really important is that many of these students, this is this is their way of, of marketing themselves. Um, it's all digital, and um, they pick up they pick up jobs from friends who like friends who like friends on social media. So it is a sort of contribute and share. Um, there are also probably much thorny issues about the use of AutoCAD and Revit, etc., and whether they're on student packages or whether they're on, on full authorship packages. Um, I hadn't thought about any of these at all. Um, but Mark, that's pretty much all I can answer at the moment, because mm -hmm. this is quite a sort of ongoing mercurial, um, totally Debbie undefined <laughs> beginning and end, you know. Um, there you go. Yeah. Well, thanks, Debbie. Thanks for the presentation. We, we do have a couple of uh, hands raised. Um, Badur, I, I don't know if Badur is still raising her hand. Um, no, maybe. my question was answered. Thank you. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Perfect. We have Mike. Robinson. Hi, uh, this is really for Ali. It's a comment, uh, but I think it's uh, nice to see you, Ali, and thanks very much for your presentation and thanks everybody. Um, but I, I, I it was, it's more, more a comment and perhaps it pertains to a number of the papers is that as usual, I think planners and developers and development authorities are usually quite a way behind the public and the communities, they're usually sort of stranded a few, a few years behind in terms of how these things change. Um, and it's, you know, and change is quite rapid now, um, uh, you know, particularly generational change. And I, and I think the key here in, in, in this, and it came out very well and, and delightfully in your presentation, Ali, was the, uh, the key word is experience. And, and, and it's trying to sort of, you know, I'm always fighting against the binaries that we, what we invent between, you know, fake and authentic, um, between tradition and modern. Um, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, for those of us who have been involved in these conferences over a long period of time, you know, we always use this term tradition. Tradition is messy. It's just fundamentally messy. And, um, uh, and I think as soon as we try and use these terms and, and we even try to adapt these notions of typologies, we just create more mess and we just sort of prolong these binaries in, 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 in the sense. And I, 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 you know, I think in terms of the, the cases you were, you were drawing out, Ali, um, I think they, they, dem they were demonstrating to me more of what Ning Wang used to term the sort of ex existential authenticity. You know, it's about what's actually there and tourists see beyond these things what, and visitors see beyond these things and communities see beyond these 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 labels in a sense. So it was just something I, I, I sort of picked up. And if we talk about transforming typologies, well, you know, maybe what the, the most radical transformation is, is, is not to use typologies here and to try and, and, and again and, and try and sort of embrace the messiness and the experiential aspect of all of these things. So, um, so it wasn't really a sort of a, a, a question. It was just something that came into my mind, you know, and listening to these things. But, uh, but again, thanks very much for everybody's, uh, you know, presentations. Can I just respond quickly, uh, uh, sure. Professor Muhammad? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mike. It's been a long yes. time. How are you, my friend? 
I'm good, I'm good. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Can't agree with you more when it comes to the notion of experience. And quite honestly, uh, Mike, in the three cases, I was really astonished that people's perception, and not to, talking about tourists only, I was so much excited about the local community. And when I say the local community here, I mean, as I said before, people coming from the country and also expats living there. And I was so much astonished with the notion of how they feel about the place, how mm. they interact with the place. And, and this is why I use the word experience. And I totally agree with you regarding that. Thank you so much. Debbie, I think raise her hand. So, um, so I think just to, to sort of, I suppose in some ways connect all three of our papers, um, I've done quite a bit of work on authenticity in South Africa and, you know, authenticity is one of those thorny things which is absolutely fantastic in the, in the, in the sort of Western paradigm and in the sort of Ikamos um, paradigm of the tangible. Um, and it sits very much with the intangible is, it's, is that it's slippery and it's forever changing. And authenticity is an interpretation based for me is an interpretation based on a constantly changing set of criteria. Um, and, you know, whether it's, whether it's sort of authenticity of, of um, the buildings that I presented being a South African vernacular, or what Ali's presented in um, Qatar and Bahrain, as he said, it's about the experience. And I think, I think of years ago being in the Four Corners region and looking at a piece of Hopi beadwork which was made in China, and it's whether the authenticity isn't highlighted by my picking it up in that particular Gallup store. At the same time, if I go to a street market selling curios in Durban, and I'm a foreign tourist, I can buy exactly the same thing the whole way up the east coast of Africa, because there's a continuous trade of batik, of soapstone carvings, of wooden carvings, etc. And they, in, in a sense, are authentic to the entire East Coast. So the ability to embrace slippery notions of authenticity and of tradition and of tangibility and intangibility, I think is really the first step in being able to climb out of those boxes, as, as Mike quite clearly noted. Um, and being able to just accept that these things are slippery notions and it gives a whole new world to be able to allow for interpretation and for understanding in my in my sort of perceptions and i suppose it also comes from from being an anthropologist in addition to being an architect my 10 cents um we have from dr may bansari yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for your presentations. Thank you to the moderator. Um, your efforts are appreciated. Um, this is just a comment um, to Dr. Ali's uh, presentation about authenticity and fakeness and the authentic fake. Um, I think just to extend the discussion, it's it's really crucial. And, and coming from um, Kuwait, uh, Kuwait University in particular, College of Architecture, um, I think this this is something real that we're dealing with every day as educators, um, the issue of authenticity and fakeness. So it's not only a discussion of heritage and conservation as a state policy. Uh, it's, it's not even about, uh, in Kuwait, it's not even about tourism and, and how to um, stimulate uh, a discussion on, uh, um, on touristic practices and identity. It is a major uh, issue. Uh, it's a major issue when you're trying to um, open the minds of your students to embrace their own heritage and to learn what where the real is, right, or where the authentic is, and to be able to distinguish that from the fake. Now, um, if you compare places like Dubai to Manama to Doha to Kuwait City, and if you look at our commercial spaces, uh, they differ somewhat uh, in subtle ways, but um, even speaking, uh, um, coming from a conservative country, we still have sort of hyper hyper identity in terms of the the shopping mall, and and our our kids still, uh, uh, our students still experience and 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 embrace that um, the superficiality, the commodification, uh, uh, the the consumerism. So they don't see it as a problem. 
most of them don't see it as a problem. Um, and that, I think, for us is the challenge. I don't know, Dr. Mohammed might agree or not with me, but it is, it is something that we find in Design Studio. Um, so if, if our own architects in training are facing this problem of distinguishing between what's authentic and what's fake and what's authentic fake, and they're not realizing even the, 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 qual the, the, the quality and the, um, the validity of uh, conservation, per se, then where are we headed, right? Because these students are, are going to be practitioners later on. They're going to be decision makers, hopefully, right? Uh, at the government levels and the state levels. So um, I think that's, a, I think it's an important question to, to ask in terms of how you incentivize uh, um, conservation, how you teach uh, conservation, how you place value, I think, how to make them listen uh, and appreciate uh, what, what you're offering, uh, Dr. Ali. Thank you. Uh, 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 Professor Mai can't agree more, and I think you, you, you shed light on a very crucial point. Uh, but let me add to what, to what you have said, also something very interesting from my own experience, because, because the beauty of this fakeness, and particularly the authentic fake, uh, is that, as I said, it, it, it helped the students and it helped the local community to create a new narrative of their local identity, a new narrative of their local heritage, to the extent that they believe in it in a very radical manner. And I would share with you my experience. Uh, last year, I, I gave in my course a lecture so much related to the an my analysis to Sukhwaqif, and that it was, they only started building it 15 years ago, and it has nothing to do with the place or the, or the, the how the souk used to look like, and so on and so forth. And a couple of days after that, I had a call from the dean telling me that number of your local students provided an official complaint that you are attacking our history and attacking our heritage. And wow. I told him, give me only one day and I would fix the situation. And in my next lecture, I invited the local architect slash designer who did the souk. And he told them that all of this started 15 years ago. It has nothing with the, with the originality of the souk. And Professor Ali is absolutely right. Although they bowed the story, but still some of them, they have a lot of hate towards me. I'm just sharing this to support you, Professor May, and say that literally we have huge challenge, challenge particularly when the local community started to establish a, a, a patriotic narrative, a sort of, uh, this is our place, this is our history. And they don't want to listen to anyone that would say, well, you know, excuse me, this building was built only four years ago, or this mm -hmm. Wikala was built only two, year, uh, two years ago, and so on. Thank you for a, a wonderful insight. Yeah, this is the role of the College of Architecture at this moment, and uh, Dr. Mohammed is nodding, right? We are the, the scapegoats, uh, basically, in the state of Kuwait, right? Because we, we pose, we, we are in that position um, of making everyone aware of what, what's happening, well, the reality of it. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. May. I actually, if I may, I'm going to say an anecdotal story 12 years ago. I do have a question for Tsiao, but after this uh, anecdotal story, when I first came back to Kuwait University, I was teaching theory of architecture, and one of the lectures I brought out the fact that in Kuwait, we don't have a single full neighborhood that's intact from from our past. And here, one of the students, she's a third year student at that time, or second, third year. She raises her hand and she says, no, you're wrong. We have Yom al-Bahar, which is a fake mini village that was created to replicate an old neighborhood. And the scale is 30% shorter than the actual scale of the actual neighborhood. And she totally believed that this was part of the old neighborhood that her family used to live in. And I didn't know if I should cry or I should laugh, but it was a moment that that's the reality. You know, it's like facing the reality of once you introduce the fake, you know, the, there is a danger to the fake. There is a danger to the fake for future generations. There's just, I mean, it's, it's okay to live in the fake. I, I tell my students, it's okay to go to Disneyland. It's fun. 
but be aware that it's Disneyland. It's okay to go to a fake village, enjoy it, but be aware that it's fake. I think, I think the problem is the blurriness that happens with time between the fakeness and the reality. Um, I, I do have a quick question for um, Zhao. Um, in, in one of your slides, um, I think it was the Li Yang Street. Um, it was, oh, am, am I? Yeah, you can hear me. It was, it was fascinating that um, the transformation, the, 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 the process in, 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 that, in that area is top down, where the government is doing that new beautiful towns, correct? Yes, yes. They are introducing investments to create um, what, the, what Professor Alice said, similar to a fake commercial street. But it is, it, it has been warmly welcomed by the locals because when it goes to the weekends, there are lots of uh, local residents and the people driving uh, 10 miles or 20 miles to, to, to join the events here, to, to have a walk there, to see a movie there. It is extremely welcome. I have to say, yeah. It's what, what, what was fascinating looking at the aerial view of both the 1905, I mean, I'm sorry, that 2005 and 2020, I think, mm -hmm. or the transformation, that the new town seems to have borrowed from different styles where I can see modernists idea of buildings with extended um, spaces and then the new urbanist style of approach. I mean, it is within, within the Chinese realm, but did that, is that something that was part of your analysis as well? I don't, because it was fascinating to see that it was within the same development. There were different styles from different periods of what we know as new urbanism or high modernism um, and so forth. Was, was the question clear? Uh, Sorry, I, I, I'm not quite, quite catch you what you mean. Okay. Can you well, repeat uh, the question? That's fine. It was fascinating mm. that the urban development in the, in the area around mm -hmm. the Liyang Street, um, it borrowed from different styles that are almost 80 years apart. Different styles of, of urban um, um, rehabilitation, urban re redevelopment. Um, mm -hmm. And that was, that was just one, one of the observations that, that for me, um, that I noticed. Um, about mm -hmm. the plan, but it's, 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 very, it's very interesting. Are these going throughout China, these types of development, urban developments? Uh, yes, yes, it is goes to not really the, f I, mean, I would say the, f the very modernized or developed cities, for example, Beijing, Shanghai, it's not, not really, but in, it is going to be ex uh, growing popular in the third, fourth style cities which has more traditional settlements in the, I mean, in the frontier, in, in the uh, suburban areas of the fourth or three tile city. So. Very interesting, very interesting. Yeah, yeah. it's growing popular in, 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 the, in the, I mean, in the three tiles or two tiles, not two tiles, three tile city or four tile city, like Huangshan city or, or let's say which have more settlements in, uh, which has um, uh, closer to, to, to the traditional settlements. Yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, this is, this is, this is fun. This is, I mean, for me, just listening to, to, to all three presentations, it's, it's quite fun. Um, we still do have a good amount of time for any other questions. I do have you know, a couple, but I'll, I'll wait to see if there are any from the audience who would like to join. Um, I, um, one, one quick, um, question to Debbie that, that when you were showing the, um, the, um, transformation of the houses and you're looking at the houses and you're, you're almost calling it, um, the new, uh, the new liberal social norms of the country of this transformation. Um, but this is this is unlike what um, um, Xiao is presenting, which is up bottom. Your yours is bottom up. Yours is like from the grassroots that are people, and that's why you're 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 trying to call it the because when you first called it vernacular, I kept thinking, well, this is not vernacular. It's built by an architect. Um, I mean, for me, the idea of vernacular is like it's a local builders, but you kept calling it vernacular. So um, if you can elaborate a little bit more about this, and then I have a question about 
it's a major transformation from the round dwellings that were on a platform to a more Western style house. So absolutely. I think, I think my, my sort of big fascination is, um, is understanding traditional, traditional settlements, which were probably very prolific. I'd say probably about 15 or 20 years ago, if you look at aerial photographs. Um, and also add into that rapid urbanization after 1994, when we got a democratic government. Um, many, many people moving to cities, obviously setting up informal settlements, um, which are square. And my interest is people moving from a sort of circular ambit to a square ambit, and then moving back to the rural areas or staying in the urban areas, but negotiating the square for the for the secular world and the circle for the religious world and these are sort of things that I'm playing with at the moment and um, it, I think these are quite important globally because as I said I work with a guy um, with, with, with a guy who teaches in history and con conservation who's looking at these interfaces in the British record um, particularly around the sort of Viking period. And I think that these are almost contemporary, contemporary, and, um, contemporary examples of possibly what was happening at that time. Um, so then the other reason why I'm calling these vernacular is um, they are, if we look, if we look at Del Upton and um, John Michael Flach, and we look at Paul Oliver, and we use all of those sort of derivatives of how we understand vernacular, and it starts getting very muddy, um, especially when you start putting things like kit buildings, wooden iron buildings, into the category of vernacular. Um, even though these are designer designed the designer has got a very peripheral role in the implementation of the building. So the ability to say my architect or the person who drew up my plans is as important as building an orthogonal building, which is very derivative of um, elements of Italianate architecture, for example. And that plan drawer is not necessarily part of the implementation process. Because if you are building in traditional areas, even though legislatively one should be submitting drawings for ratification at some sort of council process, this doesn't happen. So the drawings are really just notional and they're part of the process of the building, the incremental process of building. Sure. And very rarely, very rarely the designers don't necessarily get involved in, in the building. So it's almost like it's, it's part of the big picture. It's part, the, the, the designer or the architect has got much of a role as the column or the pediment or um, if that sort of thing. So, so it's, 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 it's very, um, yeah, it's, it's working at quite a lot of, of sort of um, oral, oral understanding as far as these are concerned. Interesting. And they are, I, we, we do have a question from Bernadette. I just have one quick question, if I may. Um, these, are, these houses are licensed, like they, you take a permit from the city, they are approved or they are built so, on? So this, this, is, this, is, this is one of the reasons why, um, so the ones in the city are licensed. So there, there, is, there are plans which are submitted. Um, but given the sort of situation of policing in KwaZulu-Natal, whether what gets built and what gets submitted might be two different things. In the rural areas, um, there has always been a tradition of not submitting drawings. Um, so this means that the drawing is really just a part of the process of the building, rather than actually an active part of a design process, if that makes sense. So it might be helping the owner to understand what they want but it might not mm. necessarily be a material part of the construction process. Um, mm. There is legislation which was promulgated about five or six years ago, which does legislate that these buildings have to get passed through a plans process, but the, the, what's it, the, the implementation of it hasn't really been followed up sufficiently. I see. Yeah. Ber Bernadette, do you have, do you have a question? Yep. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for the presentations and, and the rich discussion that um, has been 
going on. Uh, I think it's, 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 this is really relevant and I, I like the way uh, these things happen basically all over the world. Um, because uh, what you were showing, uh, Debbie and Ali, uh, is, is, is basically, yeah, everywhere, is everywhere. I have the experience from Chile um, after earthquake. So in, in heritage areas, which is what I focus on, in heritage areas, people were rebuilt as it was. Uh, the, there's no really like a model of, of how how the houses were before, but there is like an understanding, very superficial understanding on how they were, and people will rebuild in that way. Um, but not only the people, um, also kind of supported by the, inst the institution. So I think here it makes a lot of things that we're discussing on because it's so institutionalized that, you know, houses used to have, let's say, porticos and clay tiles, then the government will say, this is what you have to do for us to give you money to be able to build in that heritage area. And then the person will be doing that, you know, like the, the, the proper owner of the house will be forced to do that, but they will also like to do that. And then new people, like people will, will come and say, oh yes, this is the vernacular. And, and it's not really like that. And it doesn't work in that way. And it's way more, it's way beyond if you use one type of clay tile in the roof, or if you use a column, or if you do another column, it's, it's, it's a whole system of the house. It's, it's not something related to the material of the wall. Um, and I, I think all these issues are, are coming through. And what, what, what I would like to know is to what extent us, as the, technical academic people who know about all of these things um, should be kind of keeping doing this kind of uh, uh, fight over, look, this is not an old house. This is a very new house, which has been built using this original house and you show a photo or whatever. Um, and because of what Maya was saying as well for the, for the architects, you know, like the, the, the young architect generation, who are not able to see the difference because we have, <laughs> everyone has done this. All the heritage regulations have created this context where, where new houses and old houses are all blended together. Nobody really understands what is the difference. So to what extent we should just keep on this or, or just say, you know what, this is very popular. Let's accept this as a kind of a postmodernist Venturi way of looking things, you know, people like it. Let's you know, Las Vegas is very popular and, and that kind of thinking is very popular. Like to what extent this is, you know, a, like an, an, a very technical and academic discourse and, and something else is completely going on from, from, from the bottom up thinking. Please go if ahead. I, if I can be quite provocative, I'm increasingly getting to the understanding that in a lot of ways, the role of the architect, particularly in dramatically developing societies is actually not the same role as the architect in the global north. Um, because the voice of authority is so divorced from the reality on the ground. Um, even if I look at what the RIBA and the ARB are suddenly twigging that we have to do in the UK in order to deal with global climate change. And it's only now. Um, I think that in a lot of ways, architects who not work to use a term are actually going to lose the plot pretty quickly because we, society is the thing that seems to be dri driving design now. Um, whether it's developers or um, developers in, 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 in association with the cities, very, very little of the stuff which is proliferating is actually in the hands of architects. And I think that, that perhaps architects should think very carefully about what their ambit is and, and where, the, where the profession is actually going. Just to be provocative. Yeah, I, I see your point and I, 
I, I think I, ha I kind of agree, you know, I mean, there is always this revision for architects, you know, who, who are we in the society and what's our role and thinking about it, you know, architects is a profession, it's a relatively new profession. So, um, you know, if we're comparing to other professions, so um, I don't know if anybody else would like to um, continue the, the, the uh, the note of, uh, I think uh, also uh, what I would add to, to, to your uh, very interesting uh, uh, comment, uh, uh, I totally agree with you that this is happening all over the world with different degrees. But I would, I would say that if the route that I would select is to tell local people that uh, what you are enjoying is fake, I think it's a, it's a, it's a sort of... Uh, you lose the battle from the very first moment. And uh, I think what we need to do is to show them that there are different kinds of fakeness in the sense that when you were able to create an experience, a valuable experience in a fake context, you are actually building something interesting, which is related to what I called it, the dynamic interpretation of identity. Uh, and I think Souk Waqif particularly, the example that I've used in Doha, uh, Qatar is a very interesting example when it comes to the layers of experiences and the layers of human narrative that were added gradually to what used to start as a sort of a, a theatrical kind of setting, very similar to what I called it uh, the Al Qayya Turathiya or heritage villages. But the, the only reason for this souk to go beyond this and to be transformed into literally. Uh, a vibrant, the most vibrant place in the city is not because of keeping on telling them this is fake, but because of trying to tell them that the, the uniqueness of the place is related to you, is related to your presence as a community, is related to you accepting that the souk is for everybody. I remember when they started to open the souk, for instance, they used to have policemen on the edges of the souk preventing what who would look like a worker, a poor man, a humble person, because they want to create the souk as a sort of a gated community. And then we had a number of wonderful workshops with the, with the Ministry of Municipality, telling them that souk is about people. It's not about creating a club. And therefore now all of these boundaries are removed. And, and again, this is a, another layer of understanding people and understanding the context. So I totally agree with you, it's all over the place, but I think every place should generate its own story and its own narrative. Thank you so much. Mike Robinson. No, I just wanted to pick up on Bernadette's point because I think it's really, it's really key. And as I keep trying to remind people, all heritage was once new. And, you know, we, we, we we have to embrace this mixture, you know, um, uh, and, 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 and I think, you know, not just, not just the architectural profession, but the, the, the wider sort of heritage profession, if I can use that term, needs to get closer to, the, to what people are actually doing in reality on the ground and their own problems. Um, uh, so invariably, you will, you will have a mixture of, of, of development. You will have the old with the new. The key thing is... As a Democrat, I would say, well, it's, it's about what the local people actually want. And if there's a consensus for that, who are the experts here to say anything different? And we have increased, we have increased this gap over the years between the, you know, the, the sort of the, the heritage technocracy and, 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 and local people. And it's, you know, it, it, it's, it just doesn't work. It partly, you know, there's lots of ethical issues about that. And, and, and again, as a sort of, you know, my anthropological background really struggles with that. But at the same time, you know, um, it just doesn't work. And we see many instances of it just not working in practice. So, you know, the other, the other issue, I, I think, and, and again, and I, I know that we, we're back to typologies and categories here, you know, bear in mind the concept of fake is the intention to deceive. And sometimes we have to distinguish between the intention to deceive and what I would call more sort of reproduction, which sometimes is a genuine 
if not misplaced um, uh, sometimes. But again, you know, I, I, I feel very humble in some circumstances when I go to you know, different locations around the world and people are proudly showing off their own developments. And part of me is, 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 is you know, wearing the Nicomos hat or whatever and thinking, oh my God, you know, what would my colleagues say about this? And part of me are thinking, great, fantastic. Who am I to say? If you enjoy living there and, you know, if that's what, if that's what works, I think that's where we want to be. So again, I would say, you know, we need to close this gap with communities, which we've opened up over the years. Sorry for the rant. But no, no, that's that's actually fascinating. And I, I if I, if I may, um, and we have um, Debbie as well. But uh, I, I mean, what? Yes, I agree with you that it's you know what do people want, and who are we to dictate on them what to what they should want. But then there is also the danger of uh, falling into the trap of the consumption of fake reality, which is the perfect um, recipe for neoliberal economist who wants to just sell and sell and sell. And, and I, mean, I mean, I'm not saying that we should educate because I think we need to be educated first, but but I mean, there is this line. Where do we stand? You know, do we do we do we agree with the with the with the consumption of fakeness for the sake of because all of, almost all of these projects, the one in 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 Qatar, Doha, or or any any other place, a lot of time when it's about the fakeness that are instituted by the government, it's about creating a consumption, creating more new economy. Debbie, I I, I don't want to take more of your time, so go ahead, please. It's your session. So absolutely, very quickly, and I think a lot of this is actually done in order to be able to present the veil of development and the veil of 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 um, progress, to use a, a word that I absolutely hate. Um, but I think for me, I think what's the most concerning of everything, in especially with this global climate crisis, is that I've spent the last 20 years in a province in South Africa working on heritage. I was I worked for the Heritage Agency for five years and I was involved with them for another 15 after that. But I know fundamentally, having tried to deploy heritage projects as community-based projects in order to be able to, to grow communities and to be able to build capacity and all the other developmental speak, nothing works unless you've got social sustainability. And that is the absolute crux of anything. There's absolutely no point in putting in ground sourced heat, heat pumps if they're not going to be socially accepted and socially driven out. You know, so all of these are connected to social sustainability. And my, I suppose, my retrospective calm with the heritage crisis and all the other crises in South Africa is a matter of four years distance of realizing that this is a very contextual issue and that it has to be interpreted contextually. So it follows exactly with what Bernadette was saying. And we have these lenses of authority, which as we've been saying earlier, are totally divorced from the lenses of what the needs of people actually are. And that again comes to my comment about the role of the architect being, being needing to actually change. Um, so yeah, I'll shut up now, I've had enough. Of the <laughs> I've had enough time in this conversation. Oh, this is this is fascinating. I mean, we, we still have maybe four or five minutes. Um, so if anybody else would like to say any final comments, um, this is this is fun. I mean, if we were, we, if we were, I just want to say go... something quick, uh, Mohammed. Yes, yes, please go ahead. I, I, go ahead. I, because I was not sure that Professor Nazar Sayyad can hear us. Uh, oh, he, I think he's... I, I, I can hear you fully, and I've been following the entire session. Adam. Wonderful. You know, Nizar, I just realized yesterday that my relation with Ayasti arrived to a quarter of a century, 25 years. So I'm so happy and I'm so grateful to you and to Ayasta for creating such an enlightening, inspiring, and yet critical platform. Can't thank you enough, Professor Nazar. I'm so happy that... Uh, I did my 25 years with Ayaste and looking forward for uh, one more quarter of a century and hopefully next time we'll be together. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. I actually wanted to just give a very brief comment. I love the session. 
uh, I had to leave for one of the presentations. Um, but I, I have to say that, uh, you know, I asked, had a conference in Cairo, Egypt, uh, 23 years ago, 1998, uh, whose title was The uh, Consumption of Tradition and the Manufacture of Heritage. Uh, and it's very interesting to sort of see that some of these issues have not gone away after all of this time. Um, and, and in a sense, I am uh, somewhat uh, surprised that after all of this time, we're still talking about the dichotomy of sort of fake and authentic. Uh, I think we've gone beyond that. And, and we need to absolutely make sure uh, that this is not just simply about the audience of people that we study. Uh, it is also about the kind of terminology that we use. Uh, I don't use authentic and fake anymore. Um, and, and for me, at least, the, uh, the notion and the idea that authenticity is a uh, fundamental component of tradition uh, has completely disappeared. In fact, our conference in Italy um, uh, 22 years ago, um, uh, which was called the end of tradition, um, dealt precisely with that notion. And I think that the majority of the speakers were addressing the idea that uh, the, the search for the authentic is not only in the eye of the beholder, it is something that has to be defined and redefined with every single generation. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad that your session actually raised quite a lot of these issues. Uh, and I certainly do, don't want to dominate any of these discussions whatsoever. So uh, thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Mohammed, for running the session. Uh, th thank you for the comments, uh, Professor Nizar. Um, if we don't have any more comments, I think maybe we can take a four minutes.